To really know if you understand the concept of friction, you want to be able to answer a question like this. So if you want to pause the video, see if you really understand friction, here's the question. Pause it, try it, see if you get the right answer. But for everyone else, let's have a go. It says the figure shows a particle of mass 20 kg being pulled by two light inaccessible strings along a horizontal ground. The particle experiences a constant frictional force where the coefficient of friction is 0 0.2. Determine if the particle remains in equilibrium. So they don't tell us. Now, why is that important? Well, why is it important that they usually do tell us? Because depending on which way this particle is moving, friction is going to oppose that. Okay, so they're basically saying, look at this scenario. Is friction capable of keeping this particle stationary? Now, what students do is they say, ah, oh, 130 is huge. Of course, it's going to be pointing this way, but you don't really know that. Okay, we need to use obviously detailed calculations to show that. Okay, so the first thing is we need to understand how does friction even behave? So let's talk about friction. I'm going to write F here for now. I'm going to use my forearm as a demonstration to help you guys understand. So my calculator on my wrist, I can push that horizontally nice and easy. Yeah. However, if I turn my arm the other way around and I push, it's slightly more difficult. The reason for that is this side of my arm is hairier than this one. So there's going to be more friction because the surface is more rough. We call that the coefficient of friction mu. F is determined by the roughness of the surface. Now, there's a common misconception here. Students think that the coefficient of friction needs to be between 0 and 1, inclusive. It's not true. Coefficient of friction can be bigger than 1. Okay? Uh, silicone, for example. Metals rubbing against each other also produce a coefficient of friction larger than 1. What else is it dependent on? Well, if we go back to my wrist action here, how can I make it more difficult to move it across my forearm? This is easy, just pushing horizontally. However, if I push down and then push, I need to use some of my gym gains in order to move it, okay? Now, when I push down like this, what's happening? The contact force with my forearm is increasing. Here, I can't even move it. So as I push down, the contact force goes up. That's the reaction force. The reaction force is the contact force. That goes up. And that increases the value of friction. So friction is determined by mu and r, which we multiply together. But another thing is that friction only gives as good as it gets up until a certain point. Okay? So friction can equal mu r. That's its maximum. But it could also be less than that. Okay? And it depends on the force that it's opposing, okay? For example, if I give you guys three situations, we have a particle here, we have friction, and three. I'm going to tell you guys that it's not moving. Okay, it's not moving, so friction must be three. Let's give you another scenario. Five and F. It's not moving, but any more of this it will start moving. We call this limiting equilibrium. Friction is still 5. It's not moving, right? Friction is 5, but this would be F max. Yeah, because it's about to start moving. Any more of this right force would lead it to start moving. So you can see friction is flexible. However, if I put 10 here and F, friction is 5 because it's still at its maximum. The maximum it can be is 5. So as soon as I increase it, friction remains at 5, but now it's going to be moving, because now there's an imbalance, an imbalance of forces. Okay? So we 10 minus 5, F equals MA. Okay? So if you were to graph it, friction essentially grows, and then it flatlines. Okay? And it remains at F max. All right, where's my rubber? Here. Okay, let's start answering the question. I let you guys have some context behind how friction works. This is a great question for you guys to uh, understand friction in a lot more detail. So we have that this mass is 20 kg, so 20 g. And obviously we need to resolve our forces 
we're pretty well conditioned for that now. So this is 30 in the new uh, in the hypotenuse, and this is the opposite. So it's gonna be sine 35, and this is gonna be 30 cos 35. Dealt with. Then we've got this. This is gonna be 130 cos and 130 sine. Okay. From here we can determine which way friction is pointing, but also we have the reaction force. Don't forget that. You would have figured that out because you would have written then friction depends on R. So let's determine which way friction is actually pointing. For that, we're going to have to calculate these values separately. So 130 cos 70 and 30 cos 35. So what do they give me? 130 cos 70 is 44.46. Uh, 2, 6, dot, dot, dot. Then we have 30 cos 35 is 24.5745, dot, dot, dot. Now you can clearly see that this one's larger. So this one's larger. Friction is going to have to point this way. Now we're only going to write F because now we need to calculate if F is large enough to counterbalance the difference. And for that, we're going to calculate F max. Okay. Now we know F max is mu r. So for this, we're going to have to calculate r now. Now, for sure, it's an equilibrium up and down. Otherwise, it would be bouncing off the ground. So we have r and 130 sine 70 and 30 sine 35 equals 20g. Yeah, so up plus up plus up equals down. So R is going to be 20G, which is 20 times 9.8 minus the other two. So 20 times 9.8 minus 130 sine 70 minus 30 sine 35. 56.63. 56.632 dot dot dot. Okay, just double checking. I've typed this in probably 30 sine 35. I literally just made this up. Uh, a few seconds ago. Okay, yeah, 56.63. So now we can calculate F max. It's going to be mu, which is 0 0.2, given in the question, times this value. So times that by 0 0.2, I get 11.32. Six, dot, dot, dot. Right. Obviously, we use gravity to be 9.8. We can like round these values. That's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, in fact, if you guys wanted to do that now, uh, that's fine. I usually say just round at the end, but we could do that now. So dot dot, dot is approximately to 2SF would be 57. And then times in that by 0 0.2. Probably would just do this bit now just because uh, we then kind of referring back to it after. In fact, this can be equal. 57 divided by 5, 11.4. Now, let's take away these values. So we're going to do 130 cos 70 minus 30 cos 35. And from there, we're going to see that difference, this difference, is F large enough to counter that? So 130 cos 70 minus 30 cos 35 is 19.88. So this value, guys, this difference is worth 18, uh, 19. But friction can only provide 11.4 of support. It's not enough to counterbalance the difference. Okay, so you basically have, just to keep numbers simple for you guys to see, just say this is 44, and this value here, this value here is, just say 26, okay? The difference between the two, this F being about 11 is not enough because 26 plus 11 is 37. 37 is smaller than this. So it means that the pi core is just gonna move because the maximum value of friction is not enough to counter this. So we're gonna say this is smaller then 11.4, therefore friction 
is not enough to support or to keep the particle in equilibrium to keep mate not enough to maintain equilibrium which I write as EQUM tell me if the particle remains in equilibrium that's the answer cool so guys this is quite a comprehensive video on how friction works so if you learned something today i'd appreciate if you hit the like button subscribe for more maths content if you're interested in my a-level maths courses more details are in the description and feel free to join the Lung gang reddit page if you want to submit your own questions for the community to give you feedback i'll catch you in the next video noise